distancing and working from home, for those of you who can, washing your hands and sanitizing, and as appropriate, keeping to the WHO and the ministries of health guidelines and recommendations. And overall, keeping yourself and your loved ones safe and uh, healthy at this time. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Maxi Eric Gitau. You can just feel free to call me Maxi. I'm your moderator for the day. I am the director of the HCD Exchange, where we are uniting a community of mentors, funders, designers, futurists, academic and research institutions, evaluators, and most importantly, young people to advance learning, practice, and integration of human-centered design, HCD in other words, in adolescent sexual and reproductive health and rights, ASRHR. We will be hosting monthly forums where a global syndicate of ASRH community and HCD practitioners will be gathering together to share learnings around this shared domain of interest. We will share more details on this towards the end of this webinar. For today, we want to focus on a timely issue that is affecting the entire globe, COVID-19. Well, two months ago, we were all celebrating how, you know, 2020 looked very promising. Then, sort of out of nowhere, a couple, like no other, was thrown to all of us. And we are yet to know how it looked. This monster that is novel coronavirus has completely changed how life as we know it looks like. There are disruptions at every, at the core of everything. Interestingly, the most vulnerable people are becoming even more vulnerable and adolescents are no exception. Most of us here, in one way or another, work with and for the health and well-being of adolescents. We have seen that as adolescents are growing, there are five key things or five um, needs that rise to the top during the second decade of life for adolescents. The first one is relationships. Adolescents want to connect with others physically, sexually, emotionally. Secondly, they want autonomy. They want to be independent and make informed but very personalized decisions about their lives. Thirdly, adolescents want to experience success in their academics, in their relationships, in sports, in spirituality, sexually, and otherwise. Fourth, they want, adolescents want fun. You know, they want to have a good time, whether alone or with others. And number five, adolescents want safety. You know, they want to feel safe physically, socially, and emotionally. And these needs are all currently threatened at the very least, if not totally compromised due to the instability that COVID-19 has brought on us. And as a community, ultimately, all we want is that the sexual and reproductive health and rights, the lives and the futures of adolescents are safeguarded despite the recent disruptions. Hence today, we have a syndicate of panelists that are ready to share emerging learnings and key considerations in integrating human-centered design and ASRHR in low resource settings during an, an epidemic. And we are going to use COVID-19 as a really good case study. So today's webinar is also going to serve as a podcast recording. And before we get started, allow me to point us to a couple of guide rails that will enable this ship to keep rocking well for the next hour. The first thing is that I request us all to kindly mute our microphones because we do not want to have disruptions or random noises that are potentially going to interfere with uh, the recording as we move forward. And for the purposes of the strength and reliability of bandwidth, we're also recommending that only the speakers have their videos on. Secondly, we want to make this as informative and interactive as possible. But we realize that we have very limited time. We only have an hour and 15 minutes. So we want to make this, we want to 
creatively capture your input. And here's how we're going to do it. So on Twitter, on Twitter, please go to HCD Exchange and Joram will share the screen so that you can see and answer the question that you see on screen. How can we, as a global community, support adolescent health during this COVID-19 period? How might we, as a global community, support adolescent health during this COVID-19 period? Also, follow the conversation on Twitter. You can follow at HCD Exchange without the E and follow the hashtags that are given there. Hashtag HCD Exchange, hashtag Adolescent Health, and hashtag COVID-19. And then after each of, should you have a question actually from either of the presenters uh, who are going to be speaking, please jump in on the chat function of this Zoom and type your question there. We will summarize them and give the presenters an opportunity to address them. And after each presentation, what you're going to do is avail an email address of that particular technical specialist so that if there is a specific question that you may want to follow up with the respective speaker, then you can do so. So with those housekeeping issues off the table, without further ado, allow me to introduce the first speaker for this webinar. He has vast global experience at the front lines of adolescents SRH and child protection programming. And he's presently the director of Adolescence 360 with Population Services International. Matthew Wilson will be sharing insights from this lens with a skew on adaptive programming that A360 is doing in Nigeria, Ethiopia, and Tanzania to respond to COVID-19. Thank you, Maxi. I think you are muted for those last few remarks, um, but I'm sure we got the gist of it. Um, I think it's debatable whether I have vast experience in this field. Uh, I'm sure there are people on the line who have more. Um, and I was watching everybody's name popping up and just reminded how huge this community is um, and quite excited about the prospect of collaborating on an initiative like this. Um, so, on to my first slide. Next. Oh, lost the slides. Do we have a technical problem? No, Jeremy is sharing the slide in a in a second. Okay. Meanwhile, where are you speaking from today? Where are you based? I'm speaking from Reading, just outside of London. And I was just looking at everybody's uh, paint schemes and thinking for a creative community that embraces HCD, we all have very bland <laughs> decors. <laughs> it's just stark white everywhere. Yeah, very beautiful. All right, the screen should be coming up any second now. Wonderful. Yeah. So I'm here to share a few insights from Adolescence 360. Um, I notice on the line we've got one of my predecessors, Manya Dobson. Hi, Manya. Um, but I'm also here to learn. Um, we are not by any means, um, we don't by any means have all the answers right now. Um, we are in the dark somewhat. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing from everybody else um, and learning more about what the reality is on the ground and how in, how in different ways people are adapting. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Wonderful. So first of all, some background on A360. And I, I don't mean to share this as kind of self-promotion. Uh, it's merely as context uh, for the types of adaptations that we're having to make and the constraints in which we're working. So Adolescent 360 is working across three geographies, as Maxi shared, uh, but there are actually four interventions. They're all shaped by the same design insights. We're working in government health systems in each of those, 
Uh, and there's a deliberate reason for that. We're pursuing scale and sustainability and trying to remove financial barriers for adolescent girls. Those interventions were designed using a HCD process um, with uh, IDEO and others, a, a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, we're not a little boutique HCD project, we're operating at scale. So we're seeing uh, about 200,000 adopters of modern contraception per year. And among those are some of the hardest to reach, whether that's geographically, socially, or culturally. Um, predominantly working with 17 to 19 year olds, but that varies. Um, and that's partly because two of the four interventions are working with married girls and their husbands, uh, that being Ethiopia and Northern Nigeria. We've enjoyed some real success shifting the method mix uh, through effective counseling and, and demonstrating the relevance of contraception to girls' lives. And so we have about 40% of our adopters choosing a lark. Uh, the approach employs aspirational programming. Uh, so contraception is positioned as a tool to achieving girls' self-defined goals. And it's a holistic approach. So it embraces both SRH and elements of life skills, financial planning, entrepreneurship. We stay where user centered and by that we mean um, both focused on the adolescent girl, her husband and providers. And we've got a variety of insight gathering tools at our disposal, uh, obviously fewer in this context, um, but we're leveraging what we can. Next slide. So why is all of that significant? Well, we need to design for scale when we're seeing so many girls uh, on an annual basis. And 60% of those girls are using short-term methods and going to need to resupply at some point during a protracted crisis. But when you think about the segments in which we, uh, with which we work, there are also some constraints that we need to work around. So many of the girls we work with don't have a mobile uh, and or credit or have not given us permission to contact them through it. Um, the reach of the private sector is also limited in some of these geographies. And cost, understandably, is a barrier for many and compromises choice. But we're hopeful that the A360 approach um, that kind of looks at uh, this holistic approach um, and supports girls navigate uncertain futures um, is relevant uh, to the anticipated economic downturn that will follow. Um, we do have challenges, though. We recognise this as an intense intervention, and so we need to design with cost efficiency in mind. And as you'll see, uh, there are adaptations already underway, but we're keen to have a more thorough design process. Next slide. Retransitioning. Wonderful. So what does it look like on the ground? Well, the host governments have declared contraception as essential, um, but operationalizing that, like many policies, is uh, the big challenge. So in some cases, uh, we've been given permission to move around as staff, but that doesn't necessarily mean girls have permission to move around, and it doesn't necessarily mean we have permission to move as extensively as we would have previously. All of our events, outreach, school-based activities have stopped due to restrictions on gatherings. In-facility services have been impacted by the competing demands on the providers because we're working in public sector facilities. We've adjusted our counselling to reflect COVID considerations, like the fact that you may not have access um, uh, for a protracted period. Um, and we're anticipating issues with stockouts, uh, but we haven't actually seen a shift in the method mix yet. It's still a little bit too early to see. Our February numbers held good, but March is down. Um, we've always had stockout challenges, and the way in which we usually solve this is by moving government stock around from facility to facility within states and regions. Um, so we're investing time and effort in that still. Uh, we're investing in our comms, as you can imagine, integrating COVID-19 messaging where we can, and using those comms to get a better understanding of what's happening on the ground. We're also trying to leverage other projects that we have, uh, where we have community-based distributors, such as the MPASC programs. Uh, to try and harness those to get contraception to girls uh, that would otherwise uh, have no access. And we're scoping as well the potential to use PPMVs and pharmacies where they're open and where they're in the same geographies that we are. But overall, we've been hit by this. Uh, client numbers are down versus last month and down versus March last year. Next slide.
So as we transition to the next slide, uh, insights. So what do we know? Well, it's very imperfect information at the moment because access is restricted. Um, and we're still kind of two or three weeks into the crisis in most of the countries in which we're working. Um, but we have seen that our mobilizers and providers remain a trusted source of information, not just for SRH, uh, but for COVID-19 as well, given the queries that are coming to us and our providers. Um, we know that girls have been exposed to a variety of official public information messages, um, but there are myths and misconceptions circulating, as you can well imagine and know. Uh, girls seem to be unsettled, um, but don't necessarily conceptualize the impact that contraception might have on their ability to resupply, for instance. They're fearful of visiting facilities, which is creating challenges mobilizing them. And that fear is not just about fear of contracting COVID-19, but also, interestingly, fear of being perceived to have it and being stigmatized as a result of that. Um, we begin to see the in economic impact affecting adolescent girls and husbands, just the, the fact that shops have shut down, small trades have shut down um, their daily income uh, and their hand-to-mouth existence is in jeopardy. Um, and providers are beginning to feel that additional pressure and necessarily deprioritize SRH. Next slide. Now, there are lots of things that we suspect, but we don't really know. We can't validate right now because the full impact is, oh, if we can go back one, um, the full impact's not yet apparent. Uh, and there are really so many unknowns. There's been a lot shared um, in writing and through webinars over the last couple of weeks about the impact on SRH. I don't want to uh, spend too much time on that and duplicate what others have done. Uh, less has been said about the economic impact, and I think it's quite interesting because that's going to be far more protracted than the health impact uh, during this immediate crisis. Um, so we're going to see a lot more harmful coping strategies, school dropouts, conflict, displacement, new patterns of migration likely. Next slide. So how might we so I think collaboration is going to be fundamentally important where we have so many information gaps. As a community, we can really support one another to understand what's happening on the ground. Um, and related to that is the issue of leveraging each other's capacities. If we really truly use the centred, uh, then we need to mobilise around this issue uh, like, we don't, uh, like we haven't in the past. Um, we need to also think about the design process and we'll come to that later in this webinar. Uh, if we don't have physical access to our users, um, then how do we redesign the design process so that it remains something that uh, has fidelity with the human-centered design concept? Likewise, how do we design with and for the most vulnerable adolescents? Heard a lot over the last uh, couple of weeks about mobile health, and it definitely offers a lot of opportunities, but we need to be careful that we don't leave anyone behind. And we've got some fundamental challenges. How do we counsel for choice when cho choice is actually fundamentally limited? Um, and likewise, uh, how do we assure safety? Uh, a lot of the conversation has been around PPE uh, in the context of safety. We also need to think about how we quality assure the services that we're providing when we're unable to provide face-to-face, in-person supportive supervision. Um, it is a, a wonderful opportunity as well. Um, there is a silver cloud. Uh, to this, a silver lining to this cloud. There are opportunities here for us to really progress task shifting self care digital health. And as I alluded to on the previous slide, how do we design for longevity and an era of austerity? So we want uh, adaptations uh, that have a utility beyond this crisis. Um, and we need to remember to employ adaptive implementation, which we see as a kind of transition from HCD uh, when we move from prototyping to scaling. Um, and that's going to be fundamental uh, to an uncertain future. I think that's all from me. Very exciting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matthew. Um, yeah. And um, we will definitely uh, keep all the questions or comments that are directed to Matthew in the chat box. And, um, and also, if you uh, please kind keep the conversation going on Twitter, as was asked earlier, how might we as a global community support adolescents' health during COVID-19. Tag us um, and follow 
uh, as, as was shown earlier on the screen. So <clears throat> our next speaker is um, Georgina Page. She's the head, she's the global head of evidence and insights at Mary Stops International. And um, she's going to be speaking to us about insights from Francophone West Africa, um, a program that is based um, at MSI Sahel program. And um, so without further ado, um, uh, Georgina, if you can come to the screen, tell us where you're speaking from and take it over from here for the next um, five to six minutes. Um, we'd appreciate, thank you. Great. Hi, everybody. Um, let me know if you can hear me okay, Maxi. Yes, we can hear you just perfectly. Where are you speaking from? Uh, I'm speaking from my living room in London um, today, so it's nice to join the conversation. Um, let me know when we've got the yes, slides like up. In just a minute. I hope all is well in London. Um, it's the same as it's been for the last few days, but the sun is shining, which always makes it um, slightly more bearable. <laughs> very nice, very nice. Happy that you could join. Yeah, Take it's it great over. to be part of the conversation. Um, as Matthew said, um, it's a very interesting time to be thinking about these challenges and the adaptations that are going to be necessary as we try and find our way through this. If you go on to the, to the next slide. So I also thought it would be helpful just to give everybody a little bit of background on MSI's Adolescent Sexual Reproductive Health Programming in the Sahel. We have programs in four Sahel countries, so that's Senegal, Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso. And our focus is on providing family planning and safe abortion and first abortion care services through five different models of service delivery. Um, so everything from networks of fixed clinics to mobile outreach teams. We have franchise networks of providers in several of the countries, uh, teams of mobile midwives that go out and about, and we also work with the public sector to help strengthen and reinforce their family planning service provision. Up until now, we've been using various strategies to ensure that um, the services across all of those, those channels are adolescent friendly um, and to enable access to that core target group. That includes strategies uh, to reduce provider bias, to tailor the types of information that we're providing and the communications approaches that we're using. Um, but it's worth flagging that key to that so far has been our mobile outreach services and our MS ladies, our community-based mobile midwives. It's why I've underlined those there on the slide. Um, they've been really critical to our success in expanding access to SRH services in the region, um, largely because they involve a really strong collaboration with the Ministry of Health um, and they enable us to, to work out of public health facilities and other locations and get those services directly out to communities and to adolescents where they're most needed. Um, in the Sahel context, we've found that some of the greatest unmet need for family planning is actually among rural adolescents. Um, these young women are often already married, they may have one or more children already, um, and they're quite a specific kind of subpopulation in those four countries where we're working. Our human-centered design work so far in the Sahel, much of which has been a collaboration with IDEO.org through a Hewlett Foundation project um, has helped us through the insights research as part of that work, really understand the challenges faced specifically by rural married adolescents um, and the social and cultural barriers that are there when it comes to family planning access. We know they're often very disempowered, very isolated. A woman's status in these contexts comes through um, childbearing, rearing, and simply age. Um, and a lot of their family planning decision making is heavily influenced by, by others in their network. So husbands, mothers-in-law, and even sort of wider community norms. A lot of our work up until now, including the interventions that have been informed by HCD so far, um, has been about opening up the conversations in the community necessary to increase that acceptance of family planning among those influences, as well as also providing information and support directly to the young women themselves. Um, this is going to be a key consideration for us as we move into adapting our adolescent programming, um, knowing that there are multiple influences on that, on that core target group for us and that so far that community network approach has been incredibly important um, is going to be something that I think is quite challenging to, to adapt 
uh, to the specific needs that are going to arise. Something else that I think is going to be a key consideration that we've been reflecting on is quite how different adolescents are. We sort of talk of, about them in broad terms, but we know even um, the needs and barriers faced by an adolescent in an urban area will be different to those in a rural area. Um, and there are you know, other factors in their profile and their background that are really quite important to considering how to, to meet their needs, whether that be whether they're married or unmarried or, or their education levels or their, their support networks and social networks. So all things that we're currently trying to get a grasp on in terms of uh, considerations for adaptations. If you could go on to the next slide. So specific adolescent adaptations are obviously still something we're working through like everybody else, but I thought it would be worth just speaking as Matthew did a bit about some of the initial adaptations that are underway in our country programs. Um, as we're all very conscious of the full impact of COVID-19 and a lot of these countries is really still emerging and we don't really know what we're gonna be dealing with. Um, so our primary focus is making sure that we can safely continue to provide what we consider, and we're trying to make sure governments agree with this, our essential services, so family planning, safe abortion, and post abortion care services. So that means lots of liaising with governments in each country, um, understanding how we can adapt our service provision to their new regulations and guidance. Um, and in the Sahel specifically, where we work so much out of public health facilities, looking for other safe spaces where we can provide services, demedicalizing if we can, reinforcing our own infection prevention strategies and providing updated tools, guidance, resources and support to our providers to make sure that those on the front line are taken care of and are able to continue. Um, like all health providers at the moment, we're also playing a role in providing general COVID-19 information. So, you know, we are turned to other health provider, even if family planning is our specialty, but there's a lot we're trying to make sure we can do to help our clients understand what they can do to protect themselves, as well as letting them know what we're doing to ensure our services are safe and accessible for them and how we'll protect them and their communities. Um, to try and sort of break down some of that stigma around the fear that's associated uh, in the time of a pandemic with accessing health services. Um, and linked to that, above all, we also want to make sure that everyone knows we are still here and that they can still access family planning services and information with us. So the moment those kind of three points, helping our clients understand what they can do, let them know what we're doing and that we are still here, are kind of what we're trying to integrate across our communication channels. Um, that means radio, print, digital, face-to-face uh, -face where we can still do it but specifically looking at strengthening the non-face-to-face -face options that we have available to us. So we've got contact centers and websites for all four of the Sahel Country programs. We're trying to get as much information reinforced um, and out there through them as possible. Um, in the Sahel, we also rely heavily on community-based mobilization, especially for adolescents. That's been the focus of a lot of our HCD so far, and it's some of those routes we found that have been particularly effective at helping to break down the barriers to access. Um, so we need to have a think about how we adapt or replace that. Um, very simply, we're looking at how we encourage our teams to pull together simple job aids with key messages to make sure that they have the most important information that they need at their fingertips. And that might be COVID-19 specific. The job aid that you can see at a, a snapshot there just also focuses on how to talk to people um, at a time like this because people's interpersonal communication is all shifting. Um, so we're just trying to make sure that we keep those conversations going. Um, and in that same vein, our Sahel teams have been working really hard to understand um, what the mobilizers that they normally work with are doing in terms of COVID-19 response and how we can integrate simple FP messaging alongside everything else that everyone is trying to still communicate. Uh, definitely feels like integrated and complementary messaging has really been more important. Um, and it's something that we'll continue to think about. Um, like Matthew and PSI, we're also looking at how we adapt other existing specific streams of work. So we have a project across the Sahel looking at equipping mobilizers with tablets and rolling out digital applications to support their activities. Um, discussions are underway on what more we might be able to do with approaches like that. Um, I do think a big question remains about how we ensure those sort of digital and tech heavy approaches um, don't take the focus away from some of the more vulnerable subpopulations of adolescents that we've been working so hard to understand and reach. Um, we know that outside of urban centres in the Sahel countries particularly, literacy, local language, barriers, 
um, are going to play a key part in how we're able to continue talking to people, um, both in terms of the people we're trying to reach, but also uh, the mobilization networks that are out there on the ground that we have access to. So our focus right now is to try and listen to the needs emerging from our programs uh, and make sure that how we're adapting is really responsive um, and how we're listening is adapted as well because with everybody remote working that actually in itself becomes even more difficult. So I'm very excited to hear what other ideas people have in terms of challenges and opportunities. Thank you so much, Georgina. And um, <clears throat> it's a great build also from um, uh, Matthew's earlier presentation. And we can see from both of yours that the heterogeneous nature of adolescents, you know, keeps uh, both Mary Stokes and PSI, you know, from uh, keeps making you guys both iterate and adapt uh, pretty much in Western and East Africa. And therefore, both of you, thank you for sharing. Everyone, please keep um, typing your questions in the chat function uh, and also keep the conversation going on Twitter. Um, and we want to take this a little bit now different from, a, from, program, from programmers to um, now invite our third speaker, who is Ben Bellows. And Ben Bellows is a co-founder of Nivi, uh, which is a consumer-facing digital health company that is offering AI-powered conversational experience through Facebook through Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp. Um, so Nivi has reached almost 1.5 million users in Kenya and in India. So we cross continents a little bit and go to South Asia. And uh, so they recently launched a global COVID-19 conversations that are available to more than 2 billion Facebook users. And Ben will be speaking to us about insights from adolescents and young people who are engaging in, on Nivi during this period um, across both the South Asia and Sub-Saharan African context. And so, Ben, uh, welcome. Tell us where you're speaking from and take it over from here for the next six to seven minutes. Actually, thank you very much. And I'm speaking to you all from the second story of our house just outside of Washington, D.C. So like many of you homebound, like I guess most of the world at this point, homebound but remain connected. And it's great to be able to connect today. So thank you. Um, welcome. The, the is coming back up um, in a second. focus uh, today so. is really, I think, a starting point for a, a prospective conversation about uh, the integration of digital and the onboarding, if you will, or engaging, reaching adolescents with digital solutions like Nivi's uh, platform. And so it's an opportunity to, I think, start uh, thinking about where we're, where we're at rather than um, rather than having immediate lessons from what we've done, given that the conversations themselves on COVID uh, went live last week. And so I think, <clears throat> and similar, to, it's an interesting compliment to what I've heard so far around programming, as Maxie's mentioned, to a shift on uh, programming for adolescents to shift to presenting COVID content and now fine tuning or operationalizing it for that adolescent audience. Is the deck ready to go? We're almost there. Um, so we do leverage AI uh, for the SRH conversations that we currently uh, uh, deliver through through uh, uh, our platform on Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp. Uh, we also bring essentially this, this vision of empowering consumers through uh, with information. So we're skipping around a number of points here. Let's start from the top and we can work our way through there, shall we? Are they coming up? It's interesting. It's not all displaying. So next slide. Everyone's got questions. Yes, they do. So everyone, that's the first slide I can start with. Everyone has questions. This is saved as a PDF and forwarded as such. So apologies if it doesn't synchronize easily with the uh, presentation tech. But everyone, including adolescents, do have questions about COVID-19. In fact, that's how we eventually uh, were, that's how we launched into the COVID conversation, as it were. Users uh, on our Kenya platform in March began asking more and more frequently about COVID virus and coronavirus, rather, and COVID-related uh, questions. And so as a result, we realized this was an urgent need, kind of an emergent urgent need to address conversations uh, topics around what is coronavirus, what are symptoms, how is, how is it prevented, how is uh, COVID treated, and what does that 
that implicate for relationships, for the autonomy that uh, Maxie mentioned at the beginning, for other issues in one's life around experiencing success, success wanting fun, and, and being safe. And so those are highly relevant themes, certainly for adolescents and, and the broader general, uh, the broader user population, relevant to COVID. So next slide. The intent then in creating and responding to those questions that everyone, including adolescents, were raising was to launch this series of conversations, launch these series of conversations, this um, 17 conversations on the next slide. And it was essentially all these conversations are available on Facebook Messenger. There's a URL on the next slide that actually shows where to access that content. It's uh, m.me slash uh, ask Nivy. And from that, from that point, you, be, you actually enter into the conversations. The idea is to build out a service that users can experience. And we did this for two reasons. One, to give users free access to information, including as adolescents have access to a phone, access to COVID relevant information, things around symptoms, about myths and misconceptions, if you will, related to COVID and questions that are more pertinent perhaps to an adolescent audience around uh, relationships. Can I get COVID through kissing? Uh, very specific, um, rel well, let's say relationship relevant content uh, that would be of interest to a younger audience. So from that URL, everyone uh, can access these conversations if you like. You can try it from the comfort of your own home today and uh, see what that content uh, can, can open up. For, for consumers on the one hand, but also too for the partners you're hearing today. So the programmatic partners at a, at a wide range of organizations can leverage this platform to optimize the engagement, the digital engagement with consumers, with, with adolescent users in a way to unlock insights around what topics are of most salience, of most importance to that young audience. And so the intent in developing these conversations was not simply for Nivi to go out and do something, but to empower organizational partners to go out and optimize their engagement through their digital channels using Nivi tools. Next slide, please. Let me just scroll down through the next one. That'd be great. All right, so the idea was on the idea, uh, the first goal we had, again, was to promote awareness and responsible behavior amongst a wide number of target audiences, including adolescents. Next slide, please. And doing that through this notion of, an, of a sustained engagement. So we begin by marketing online, uh, this, the, to bring, to raise the salience, to raise the importance of the topic to the front of the mind, if you will, to the point of action where someone will click through on an ad that they see a digital ad they might see in their Facebook timeline or there on, on Facebook, or you could imagine doing this sort of marketing offline to help consumers become, help users uh, see the, the importance of asking that first question. In onboarding into the Nivi platform, they, they ask a question with a keyword if they come through SMS or that unique referral link through Facebook. And that then lets us know how or which campaign was the most productive in reaching them. And they ask a question and the AI, it's a very limited use case for AI and it's right now constrained, if you will, focused on the SRH portion, but it does a content analysis to understand or classify the intent in that initial question. They're then onboarded into automated conversations if possible, or move over to the human centered, uh, the, the human agents in Nairobi to answer questions that ultimately lead one to addressing information gaps and two lead to action. So that, that idea of nudging or encouraging individuals to take what might be a self care move uh, or behavior change or more broadly in the SRH space, thinking about contraceptive uptake, pregnancy tests or other important outcomes that are meaningful in the lives of our users in a, in a very longitudinal kind of health journey sense. Next slide, please. So with respect to uh, COVID, there's, uh, the idea is to now move them through, uh, help them address questions. So this, this idea of triggering, I'm not sure, well, priming the user with, with these marketing ads. So we've already launched, these are examples of uh, ad marketing assets. They're now live on the, at the URL you saw earlier. You can see these assets at play. Uh, they have their own uh, probably uh, higher or lower probabilities. They have their own performance, if you will, that we're seeing real time. 
with users on Facebook responding to uh, certain calls to action with these with these um, marketing assets. So different, uh, we do this in Swahili and English. You can see the sort of responses. In fact, our kissing ad, Nawe Zapata Coronavirus from Kissing is, is, is actually the one that's being most shared currently with over 500 shares at this point. Um, so a lot of interesting engagement with content. Next slide. The idea with that, in, with engaging the marketing piece though, on the next slide is to now enter into those automated conversations. And that's, that's really where uh, the learning takes place. And it takes place in this sort of uh, series of chats uh, through, through Messenger. Next slide, please. And the idea is with doing that, they can address topics that they're selecting, that they're drilling through. And we've seen, I think on average, we've reached a quarter million, 250,000 people with the ads in the last week on Facebook, and then about four or 5% convert to users. And of those users that come through, uh, we're getting about three conversations on average uh, being explored. So there are certain topics that are of higher relevance than others. But why is this important for everybody on the call today? And I think the, 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 the second goal we have here, which is to improve partners' ability to motivate behavior change is really what's driving this. This is an opportunity for all of us here to organize, to, to coordinate, if you said, in a sense, the, the messaging and ensure that there's a reduction of misinformation on the one hand and an augmentation or an amplification of the correct, uh, of health authorities messaging. So what we're, what we're doing with these conversations, we're drawing the content from WHO, we're drawing it from CDC, we're drawing it from the Kenyan Ministry of Health and amplifying that voice through your outreach, through your uh, target audience engagement. Next slide, please. So just real quick, we have a, a few slides, uh, or uh, one slide rather, that shows just the first 48 hours engagement. You can see that the distribution of topics explored, of conversations explored is not uniform. The prevention was the most uh, relevant or the most engaged uh, uh, conversation topic followed by uh, relationship questions and then who's at risk and symptoms and et cetera. So the idea is here to, to surface insights about what's happening in this space why it's relevant to adolescents and other uh, uh, target audiences, and do that through a data-informed or evidence-based approach with at least 38 or more data points that can be derived from this engagement that consumers have, that users have of all ages uh, on this content um, and re of relevance today for our, our target, target audience today on, uh, on adolescents. So uh, that's my presentation. Glad to take questions as we go forward. Thank you. Maxi, you're on mute, sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ben. I appreciate you for your presentation and for taking time to prepare that. Um, and um, for everyone, the speakers who have just spoken will are actually now all available. Ben, Georgina, and uh, Matthew are all available on chat uh, to address some of the uh, very nice comments and questions that are coming up on the chat function. Uh, so please keep keep that conversation going, but because we still have two more speakers to go, um, allow us in the interest of time and also to segue perfectly from what Ben has just spoken. Uh, let's take this now to a different notch. And, uh, um, and that notch is that uh, using design health, I mean, design thinking and uh, human-centered design particularly, has proven to be very exciting and um, responsive to most of the pain points that adolescents face. But COVID-19 has come in, and Matthew addressed this at the beginning, it has come in and completely challenged even how design is being done. So our next speaker, Courtney Chang, is a senior program lead at IDEO.org. She leads um, an initiative called Billion Girls Collab that is driving cross-sector and cross-stakeholder uh, collaboration and innovation for adolescent girl health and wellness in East Africa. And her angle that she'll be taking us through right now is a thought on how to reimagine this design process during the COVID-19 period. And she'll also be taking us through a very exciting rapid design challenge that's in the offing. So Courtney, the floor is yours. Tell us where you're speaking from and take it over from here for the next five to six minutes. Great, thank you so much, Maxi. I'm Courtney Chang. I'm speaking from San Francisco in this which looks like this today. Mm -hmm. um, Maxi gave a perfect introduction. I've been invited to speak on the implications for that design process, given the disruptions that COVID-19 brings. Next slide, please. 
Um, and he perfectly also outlined the challenges we're facing with this approach that a lot of us have traditionally envisioned as a very high touch in person and deeply immersive process. So what does it mean when we have to be physically distant from each other and how do we still get meaningful insights and learnings when applying human-centered design to programming? Next slide, please. Uh, but I think, I mean, at IDEO.org, we see this type of moment is truly what makes it an opportune challenge and moment for design, uh, with design being an inherently flexible, adaptive, and empathetic approach that really leans on creativity to connect with end users and is also built on this principle of rapidly building solutions to test quickly. So we still believe human-centered design is a great approach for solving anything that requires this type of behavior change, this type of digital and service design, and of course, pivoting the, dramatically the type of service from being an in-person service to being one that has to be done remotely. Next slide, please. So in the past month, we've ha already had the opportunity to test a couple new ways of doing remote and digital collaboration. And we have been excited and surprised to see some of the unexpected benefits that this remote approach to design research and prototyping has brought us. A couple of them I highlight on the slide here. The first being is we notice participants being a little more forthcoming than we might traditionally see. Something about having that screen or a phone in between the participant and the interviewer provides a level of safety that might not be there in a face-to-face -face focus group discussion or interview. An example is we had a colleague at IDEO working in Indiana where they hired a local design researcher and recruited a community connector to, to, connect, to conduct some of the research. And they were able to share radically honest feedback with the design team that might not have been shared with the design team had they been in the room. So it's a really exciting uh, opportunity to kind of design ourselves out of the room. The second is with new methods and tools and activities we're trying, like digital diaries, photo diaries, voice recordings, we're really getting a different peek into people's lives that's beyond that single moment that otherwise we might happen to be in front of a user or popping into their home. Um, and it's giving those participants a level of agency, perhaps, about what they're sharing with us, when they're sharing it with us, how they're sharing it with us. Um, and even one further layer to this is kind of doing everything remotely and digitally and not all on physical sticky notes and post-its that we usually do is also giving us a chance to invite participants back into the insights uh, and synthesis process to review kind of how we're processing their their quotes and their stories with us to make sure that they're rep being represented um, and their stories are being told in a way they would like to be. And the last the last dimension is it's giving us a chance to really increase our reach of participants in a given moment. Certainly, using digital channels like WhatsApp or Facebook groups is allowing us to reach a larger sample size of participants um, and even getting to just be an observer on an existing WhatsApp group or an existing Facebook group is giving us a different type of insights and learnings than we might normally focus on. But I'm, I'm also cognizant that a lot of us are designing for communities or girls who don't have access to phones, who don't have access to internet, who don't have the digital literacy required to engage in some of these ways. So at IDEO.org, we've also been brainstorming about how we might engage us to do uh, this type of back and forth response and to do so ethically as well. Um, some of our early ideas have been really leveraging team connectors who might, we might be able to empower to conduct some uh, interviews um, remotely or by phone in their communities, buying phone credit um, for girls or even hiring someone in the community to be a gossip documenter. We were inspired by a project, um, HIV AIDS project in Malawi where they had folks in the community journaling just the local gossip they were hearing in the, in the streets and houses. Next slide, please. So with that, I would just leave um, our community today with 
three tips on, I think, to consider as we shift and sustain a new way of using human-centered design in adolescent youth and sexual health programming. The first is it's really an opportunity to find local champions and to design with local champions. Be these peer connectors or teen educators. This is a moment when we can really leverage some other folks in the community to design, to interview by phone, to co-design with our team and to create much tighter feedback loops. And we're really excited for that chance. The second is rather than getting hung up or lamenting not being able to use a specific design method we all might traditionally love and use like a circle of trust or a card sort, let's really anchor on what question we're trying to ask through those methods and empower our teams, our designers, our program managers to get creative about how else we might find that answer to that question. So if a circle of trust activity is about really understanding who girls trust for um, questions and secrets in their communities, let's find other ways to, to get to that, to get to that dimension. And lastly, we really believe, you know, now is the time to really act now, act together. It's not the time for politics or complexifying the problem or the time for proprietary solutions and IP. We need, this response needs quick action. We need to work together and we need to be generous with our learnings and our solutions to fight this global pandemic. Um, and we really need every organization and every adolescent to feel and own these solutions. So with that, I would just ask to flip to the last slide. Um, Maxie, is this an appropriate time to share this opportunity? Yes, okay. please do, please do. Great, so we're, we're really excited to share this upcoming opportunity. Uh, like Maxie mentioned at IDEO.org, I lead an initiative called the Billion Girls CoLab, which is a platform for pooled innovation and collaborative impact that's focused on adolescent girl health and well-being. So we're partnering with HCD Exchange this month to launch a design sprint um, funded by the Hewlett Packard Foundation, Packard Foundation in case for her, to come up with an adolescent responsive COVID-19 solution. And we are looking for partners to join us. Here are a couple details here, and I'm sure Maxie will help circulate um, the link and the, the design briefs for those who haven't seen them yet. But we are circulating four design briefs related to adolescent COVID-19 responses that range from accurate information sharing and relevant messaging for adolescents to what happens when access to contraception methods are disrupted to mental health services. And this week we're circulating this far and wide to understand what solutions are most needed by folks in the communities that you're all hearing from. And we'd love to hear responses from you and also expressions from, of interest from partners who would be up to joining this design sprint with us. We're envisioning it will be four weeks. We'd love to bring two to three partners on board to heavily engage with us. And this would look like um, helping us, re helping recruit, helping inform what is happening on the ground. Um, but then at the end of this, certainly all of these insights and learnings and outputs will be made open source and shareable to both the HCD Exchange and Billion Girls communities. So um, yeah, Mac, I think HCD Exchange will follow up to circulate the, that expression of interest and the link, but we are collecting responses until Friday, April 10th, this Friday. Thank you to all those who've already responded. We're super excited to see all the responses coming in and we'll be following up with some questions this week. And we hope to hear from a couple more of you by the end of the week. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you, Courtney. And the link uh, for this has been shared um, from, just look for Joram HCDX on, your, on the chat function. Uh, the link for that um, uh, has already been shared there and uh, it's also going to be shared on the HCD X, uh, exchange Twitter page. So please remember to fill it by uh, close of business this Friday as Courtney has mentioned. Um, and uh, right now there's a lot of insights uh, generation that is happening. So I am pleased to also welcome Maya Hansen who is the program specialist, uh, Adolescents and Youth with um, UNFPA SRO. Uh, SRO is East and South uh, uh, Southern 
Africa Regional Office. And um, she will be speaking to us about a regional survey that they're also conducting in partnership with a couple of other organizations uh, to sort of find out the needs of adolescents and youth during uh, the coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic in the, in the, in the East and Southern African uh, region. So greetings to you, um, Maya in South Africa. Are you in Cape Town? Um, or Jobag, and welcome, please take it from here uh, for the next three to four minutes so that we also left with a few more minutes to wrap it all up. Great, thank you, Maxi. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity to join the webinar and, uh, and first and foremost to learn from all of you. Um, this has been so amazing. And I'm sure that if we put all our collective experiences and, and ideas together, uh, we can actually create a great response, uh, co-create a great response for, for adolescents and young people on adolescent sexual and reproductive health um, in Africa and beyond. So let me just explain first that I come from the United Nations Sexual and Reproductive Health Agency. And as such, uh, working with adolescents, young people to fulfill their sexual and reproductive health uh, needs and rights is really at the core of our mandate. I'm representing, I'm sitting here in Johannesburg, which has now become the epicenter of the epidemic or pandemic here in Africa. But I'm also speaking on behalf of uh, 22 other countries where we are represented in the region. So um, can we go to the first slide, please? So I'm going to talk about the Have Your Say um, survey, which is a survey that was launched about a week ago. Um, and it was really um, launched in a sort of, as a response to uh, the feedback that we received from a lot of the young people in our networks that we are working with throughout the region, um, who said, you know, everybody talks about young people, but there are very few uh, that listen to us. At that time, when we came up with the idea, it's about two weeks ago, the pandemic had only just started sort of like rolling out here in, in Eastern Safa and Africa. Uh, and the young people really felt that again, once again, they were sort of seen as a threat to the potential um, impact that um, uh, COVID-19 could force on the continent rather than being seen as a resource. So we said, okay, let's ask the young people about what their experiences are, um, what impact it has on their life, and how we can engage them better as innovators. And that was really sort of like the background for this survey. Next slide, please. So the survey, while we're waiting for the next slide, the survey was, was developed in a joint partnership with UNESCO, uh, UNAIDS, Restless Development, and AFRIAN, all in, uh, with the regional structures also that, are, uh, that are representing East and Southern Africa. And as I said, the idea was to uh, explore and learn from the experiences, challenges, learnings, and actions taken by young people due to the outbreak of the coronavirus here um, in the region. Um, we wanted to really see how we could collect findings, collect perspectives um, from the young people to further enrich our communication, to target our communication specifically to their needs, and also to see how that could be used to uh, uh, inform our reprogramming with and for uh, adolescents and youth throughout the region. As I said, the, the survey was launched last week um, and it is open for now up until the 14th of April, that is uh, the beginning of next week, just after Easter. It's available in three out of the four official languages in, in Eastern South and Africa, that is English, French and Portuguese, we, and the exception is um, Kiswahili. As of yesterday, we received 120 responses. Um, I just double check today, it's, it's gone up a little bit. A lot of the responses are coming from the young people, uh, the youth networks or representatives of youth networks that we have asked to be our eyes and ears in their communities. 
So many of the questions are not necessarily asking about the lived experiences of the young people themselves, but asking them about what is happening in the communities. And as such, you can see how those 120 or 150 responses are actually representing the views of many more young people um, throughout the region. Next slide, please. So um, we are starting to sort of like analyze the findings uh, preliminary, and we have tried to classify our, the responses that we receive from young people into three specific roles as they are being articulated by themselves. So, and or questions being asked. The first one is, am I infected? The second one is, uh, am I impacted? And what is the potential impact for myself and my family and my friends now and in the future? And finally, how can I be better engaged in innovation? So the, the trends that are sort of coming up in uh, the survey is the lack of availability of factual data both in general and about youth specifically. And again, we are not necessarily just talking about the young people that uh, are infected, but we are really talking about data about where can I find information, where can I find age-appropriate information, youth-friendly information that is not too technocratic and speaks to my specific needs and capacities and availability of communication channels. So, uh, and then they are also talking a lot about the role of youth in disseminating of, uh, dissemination of information through youth-friendly channels. So as some of the previous speakers have already alluded to, there's a huge issue of reaching the most vulnerable populations amongst the adolescents and youth, for example, disabled, with uh, correct and accurate information, again, using channels that are, um, that they are able to understand. So in many cases, we hear about digital ways of engaging, including for this survey, but we do have to recognize that in many communities, there might just be one radio, uh, one phone, and very limited access to internet. And even where that exists, currently they do not have enough funding to pay for airtime. And then finally, the young people were saying, uh, as one of the previous speakers talked about, misbusting. Um, the, the, the belief out there is still that very much that COVID-19 is an old man's disease. Um, uh, and while that might be true in other parts of the world, if you look at European statistics, for example, this may not be, it may not be applied to the African context. Um, but the, uh, the reality is, again, that there's very little information available. I have included one graph here from WHO from 25th of, uh, from the situation um, uh, updates from the 25th of March. And here you can actually see that this, the data that we see in many other countries uh, and what we see here in Africa is very different. And you see both for men and women that at the age group of 20 to 50 is disproportion disproportionately affected by COVID-19. COVID much more so than what you see in other uh, parts of the world. And finally, there's a lot of false information circulating about the channels of, um, of, of transmission, the protective measures, and uh, many other issues um, that we need to address. Next slide, please. So the next uh, slide is really about the role of young people as being impacted. And that goes both in the short term and in the long term. So as some of the other speakers talked about, a lot of our focus right now is on the current situation. But the realities out there is that a lot of the young people are not only concerned about what is happening now, but much more so about what is going to happen in the future. Will they be able to go back to school? Will they be able to complete their exams? Will they be able to find work? And what is the economic impact for themselves and their families? The, 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 the issue of impacted versus uh, infected uh, is a slightly diverse one because what we have seen is that there's a partial or full lockdown in most countries. So while young people may not necessarily all be 
infected by COVID-19, they are all impacted because they cannot go to schools. Well, we talk about formal or informal ways of education are all closed. There's a temporary close of programs, including for alternative education and safe spaces for vulnerable populations. There's a closure of public spaces and physical distancing, which are a concern for the young people. Um, there's, a, like I said, the loss of income, both with short and long-term closure of own and family businesses, and also, um, also the issue of not being able to go back to work. Uh, for many of the young people. And then as, as many of the other speakers have talked about limited access to healthcare in particular, sexual and reproductive health, access to a HIV, uh, ARV, and sexual and gender-based violence uh, prevention and protection services. And here, what we see as UNFPA, we are working mainly through government, through ministries of health, and to a certain extent through CSOs and NGOs. And while we are moving towards an integration model where adolescents youth friendly health services is integrated into the public health system, the mo main mode of delivery in, in most of the countries remains these standalone services. And so when ministries of uh, health are going through their prioritization exercises and identifying what is considered essential and critical services, those parallel structures are often closed down and therefore, the young people have nowhere to go and seek services. And finally, there's the issue of psychosocial and mental health and well-being, which is a major, major concern. Sadness, frustration, anxiety, are words that come up over and over and over again um, in the survey. Next slide, please. So finally, as a nice tale, I think to, to this uh, a closure of this discussion is really the young people as being agents of change and innovators. Um, while they are all in lockdown and affected by the lockdown, I think they all hold brilliant ideas and a lot of them have come out from the survey already. And so this is really just a, a snapshot. So support young people in community engagement is a major untapped resource even with physical distancing that we need to tap into. Um, engagement of young people in risk communication online and offline is another one. And again, if even if it is only one young person holding a, 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 a smartphone or a phone with any type of internet um, connection, that person can be a resource for uh, communication to many other young people in the communities. Uh, we talked about the reach out to young people through digital platforms uh, to promote comprehensive sexuality education where it exists, especially for those out of school uh, programs that are still um, kept alive during these difficult times um, and, and really looking at how we can uh, add COVID-19 um, uh, content into the, those um, sessions. And then leveraging resources of youth organizations. In most countries, all of us are supporting youth organizations. Again, they have brilliant ideas. They have brilliant uh, networks all the way down to the community level that they can actually help us communicating through. Violence against adolescents uh, and youth is a huge thing. Uh, evidence from all over the world suggests that uh, incidents of violence against adolescents and youth is increasing in all countries that have gone through the initial stages of COVID-19, whether you talk about the global north or the global south. So this is an issue that is of concern to young people and are looking for new channels on how they can both prevent and protect themselves against this. And also looking at the potential consequences, including issues of child marriage and including issues of teenage pregnancy. Um, then there's the continuity of education through non-formal education and recreational activities is, is um, another one that has been identified by the young people. And finally, ensuring continuation of youth-friendly health services, not as facility-based services, especially not where the existing youth friendly health uh, service centers have closed down, but through outreach of services, for example, through pharmacies or shops that are still kept open in most countries, through mobile clinics or other types of remote delivery of services. 
Okay. So um, I think this was the final slide for me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Maya. Um, and yes, your slide um, together with uh, your email address will also be shared at the end. There are so many questions that are coming up about uh, where, whether it's a, the link to the um, survey is available. Yes, that will be availed at the end of uh, the website. But um, Maya will actually send it right now to the chat function so that everyone can can access it, but we will also follow up with just some quick um, summary uh, decks of what has been shared here, the design challenge with the link for that, uh, together also with a lot of what young people have been able to be, uh, or have been doing collectively as a global youth community in addressing COVID-19 for adolescents and youth. Um, there's a whole deck of that that has been prepared by uh, HCD exchanges, uh, youth liaison officer, and we'll also be sharing that alongside other key documents that have been used for this website. Um, it's just four minutes to the top of the hour. We may not have sufficient time to actually address a lot of the questions that uh, have been coming, but we do have, um, I do have a way to conclude this for us. I feel uh, there's been really interesting, wonderful things that are coming up right now. Uh, one amongst uh, those is that uh, as a global uh, community, we, 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 we are presented right now with an opportunity to actually collaborate more, um, maybe, you know, distill um, processes that make it difficult to work together and to unite. So where, where potentially it would have taken longer to process um, you know, innovations and to process collaborations. Uh, right now, there is, I think, a call across board from the charts and also from the presentations that are coming to open room, you know, for a lot of those to actually be assessed, accessed and easily accessible a lot, a lot faster. There's also the idea that it's important to keep listening and keep our ears on the ground a lot more for what young people really truly want and therefore the survey and also uh, finding interesting ways to hear what young people truly need and want during this time and ensuring that they participate in the, in the design solutions that are most meaningful for them during this period is a, is, is a key aspect that is arising right now. And then adaptive programming has never made more sense than it is actually making sense right now. It, and it's not just repurposing you know, resources, but it's also just ensuring that you know, we collectively uh, sit and really think uh, for this season, uh, and maybe it is undefined because you truly do not know how long it's going to take. How do we properly uh, adapt uh, our thinking and our programming right now? So, um, and many other takeouts that there are, uh, because also the adolescent is not a, homoge a, homo a homogeneous population. What works for adolescents in uh, Francophone West Africa, rural, is not the same that works for East African uh, urban in, 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 in Nairobi, and it's not the same that would work in India or so Johannesburg as we've listened to that. So um, as I've mentioned, we're going to share a couple of decks uh, with you, and uh, the webinar recording is also going to be available on a YouTube channel that we're going to share with you as a follow-up email, and as well as, um, as, well as, as a podcast for all of our collective uh, viewing together with this resource document that you're also going to make available uh, as, 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 as part of uh, how we conclude this. Uh, during these extraordinary times, um, we as the HCD exchange community, we want, to, um, we want to continue to coordinate, to connect, and to catalyze um, you know, this particular community uh, around this issue of COVID-19 uh, alongside the, you know, the shared, the shared domain of interest that we, we, we rally together around, that's adolescent sexual and reproductive health, and, you know, everything else that encompasses that. So we will definitely be reaching back to you. We want to be having monthly learning forums that are very much led by this community. So we'll be reaching to you to organize those, but potentially they should be happening on the same day every month. Um, and therefore we will be, we'll be extending an invitation to you. But for, to all the speakers, to Courtney, to Matthew, to Ben, to uh, Georgina, and to, uh, to Maya, thank you so much for preparing um, and ensuring that you got ready for this. Uh, there's a, still a lot of questions. You don't need to log, to log out immediately, but in honor of the time that people are committed to, uh, so still feel free to still share uh, 
you know, your responses to those, but we'll collect those and come back to you. And to everyone who made time to join this call, we really appreciate your time and we'll definitely be getting back in touch with you. For now, that is it. And from the HTB Exchange, please take care. Thank you.